I'm convinced there are many people in this county who would be delighted to accept Jesus Christ as Savior if they did not have to accept Him as Lord. They want the good things that He has to offer, but they're not interested in bowing the knee to His authority. In truth, we cannot have Jesus as Savior unless we also receive Him as Lord. In the first century, they did not tell people about Jesus being the Savior, baptize them, and then bring the Lordship of Christ in through the back door. They preached the Lordship of Jesus Christ up front, and people knew something about the demands that He would make on their lives even before they became His disciples or His followers. According to Acts 2.36 in his great Pentecost sermon, the apostle Peter said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. According to Acts 10.36, when he preached to the family of Cornelius, he said, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say you know. According to Acts 16.31, the jailer was told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. At Acts 18 and 8, Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all of his house. At Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Jesus is Lord, thou shalt be saved. At 2 Corinthians 4, 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. At Colossians 2, 6, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Repeatedly, lordship is emphasized in the conversion of people to Christ some 1,900 years ago. A gospel meeting was held in the little country community where I grew up, about 30 miles north of here, when I was 13. A man by the name of Z.D. Barber did the preaching. Now, he was a powerful man. When he talked about hell, you could smell the smoke in the house. That's just how strong he was. Now, I don't know how in the world I wound up in the meeting house to hear him, but I was there. I'm just sure that no one invited me. But I heard him one night, and he brought conviction to my heart. I went back the next night and heard him again, and I said, I'll go no more. And the reason I cut out on that meeting was, at age 13, I was involved in activities that I simply did not want to give up. I did not want to change, and I waited six long years before I ever went to another church building where New Testament Christianity was taught. After I was discharged from the military in 1948, I came here to school. And it wasn't long... Because of my class being taught by Dr. Jack Sears that I began to hear such passages as Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I heard, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22.16. I heard Mark 16.15 and 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And it didn't take me long sitting in Jack's class to see what I needed to do to be saved. But there was a struggle taking place in my life. First of all, I didn't know whether I wanted to change. And in the second place, if I wanted to change, I wasn't sure that I could change. I've talked to many a person about becoming a Christian only to hear something like this. Well, the Christian life is too hard for me. And from the perspective of the individual who makes the statement, he is exactly right because he's thinking in terms of living the Christian life in his own power and his own strength. He fails to realize and understand that once he becomes a Christian, he comes under the grace or the power of God and he receives the indwelling of the Spirit who enables him to overcome. But from his perspective, I can't live the Christian life because it's too hard. He is right because he thinks he's going to do it in his own power and in his own strength. And so I was struggling with this view. I'm not sure I want to change. And if I do want to change, I'm not sure that I can change. The key to lordship is repentance. That's when you yield your will to his will. That's when you reach the point in life you can say, not my will, but yours be done. And that was the struggle in my life. I don't know when I repented. It must have been on Thursday or Friday. But I do remember this. The following Sunday, I went to church, and that was the second time in a period of six years where I'd been inside a church building where New Testament Christianity was taught. But I'd made up my mind I would respond to the invitation. I sat on the back row. Incidentally, if there had been a row farther back, I would have been on it. But if you plan to answer the invitation, it's not too smart to get at the very back. But there I was. And when they extended the invitation that morning in a trembling fashion, I stepped out into the aisle, walked down to the front, gave someone my hand, God in my heart, made the good confession, and about two hours later, I was baptized into Christ. 
But the problem with me was not an intellectual understanding of what I need to do to be saved. The problem with me was, am I willing to change? Am I willing to let the Lord run my life? I'd been in, in the army, been in the infantry, and I'd learned to take orders. And I looked to the Lord Jesus Christ, frankly, as the commander in chief. And I felt like that if he said it, then I needed to do my dead level best to try to put it into practice. I knew the day I came to Christ, even though I didn't know much, I knew that I had to change my attitude toward the opposite sex. And you can go ahead and make of that whatever you want to. Make it just as harsh as you will, and you'll probably be right. I knew I had to change my attitude toward those of the opposite sex. In the second place, I knew that I had to give up drinking. There are so many people who think you become an alcoholic only when you're 45 or 50 years of age or maybe even older than that. Stonewall Jackson, a well-known Confederate general, said he wouldn't drink whiskey because he liked its taste. Well, I can say the same thing. I liked it. I'm not talking about drinking it straight, but I'm talking about when it was mixed. I absolutely enjoyed drinking whiskey, and I was a teenage drunk. I tell my students here at school, if the officials at Harding had known, they could have kicked me out of school three times after I enrolled and before I became a Christian because I was drunk three times. Fortunately for me, they didn't find out about it. But I knew I had to quit drinking. I wish I could tell you that I haven't had a drink since I've been a child of God, but that wouldn't be true. I was preaching in South Arkansas and had laryngitis. And trying to preach with laryngitis is like trying to pitch with a sore arm. And I was really having some difficulty. And there was a sweet sister in the congregation who was absolutely certain that a hot toddy would take care of my laryngitis. Now, if you don't know what a hot toddy is, that's when you mix soda pop and whiskey and you heat it. So I let her talk me into it, and I drank it. It didn't do me any good. I should have known better because the community drunk where I grew up always had a cold. But now that's, that's the only drink that I've had since I've been a Christian. I knew when I became a child of God that I had to quit gambling. I remember in the army seeing those boys down on their hands and knees. Somebody had to gallop in domino shaking them. Seven come eleven. Seven come eleven. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. And that always looked pretty silly to me when they were shooting craps. But I'll guarantee you one thing. When they got out the cards, that was something else. Poker was a thinking man's game. And I was a thinking man. I played poker for 18 hours at a time. Leave the table only to go to the bathroom or to get something to eat. I've lost two-thirds of a month's salary in one night. I've taken the last nickel from a married man who needed his money. But I was addicted, folks, to poker. I absolutely enjoyed and loved to play that game. I wish I could tell you that I hadn't gambled since I've been a Christian, but that wouldn't be true. Now, I stayed in East Dorm. Now, that was right back in this direction on the Kensett Road. Now, that's where the saints were. We were in East Dorm. West Dorm's where the sinners were. So I went over to West Dorm one night. And I was walking down the hall, and I thought I heard a familiar sound behind one of the doors. Sounded like the folding of pasteboards to me. And so I knocked, and I was allowed to enter. Sure enough, penny any poker game in progress. And I thought I'd watch. <laughs> yeah, watch. First thing you know, first thing you know, I was right in the big middle of it. And Dame Fortune was shining on me that night because I won most of the pennies. But my conscience was eating me up. And I took that double fist full of pennies and put it back on the table. And I said, boys, you get what belongs to you. I've sinned. And I went to my room and I prayed to God and asked him to forgive me. And I haven't played for money any time since then. But I loved to play poker. I knew I had to quit gambling if I intended to be a Christian. I knew also I had to clean up my language. Now, in the military, as many of you know, most of the men you're associated with are profane and obscene. Now, that's just the truth of the matter. And I had picked up profanity and obscenity in high school and got worse while I was in, in the Army. But I want to say this. Ray Wright's here somewhere. And Ray Wright made a statement one time that I've never forgotten. Even when I used that kind of language, I had sense enough for the most part to use it only in the presence of fellow animals. I'm saying that if I got around a decent woman, I would ordinarily clean up that kind of talk and simply wouldn't use it. But I knew if I became a child of God, I had to quit using profanity, and I had to quit using obscenity. I wish I could tell you I haven't said a bad word since I've been a Christian, but that would be a lie. Now, I do pretty well until I get angry. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. You know what that means? It means when you get mad, keep your mouth shut, because if you ever... Get it open. If you're not careful, 
you'll say the wrong thing. Dear God, please forgive me. If you'll help me, I won't do it again. But I knew the Lord didn't want that kind of talk. Everything I've said thus far tonight, I know you agree with. And if you hear something that you disagree with, I hope you'll hear me out until I've finished. I wasn't real big at dancing, but I went to dances before I became a child of God. And I decided without hearing a sermon that I ought not to go, that I wouldn't go, because I really didn't think the Lord wanted me to go. And I reached that conclusion on the basis of what I'm about to say. First of all, alcohol was almost always present at the dances. And in the second place, foul language was abundant. And in the third place, I knew what took place after the dances. And in the fourth place, I knew the basis of the dance in the first place. Well, what was it? Sex appeal, pure and simple. I never danced with a man in my life. I'm going to tell you something. If I start going again, it's not going to be to dance with a man. Now, once in a while, I saw a couple of girls dance together to keep being wallflowers. I never saw two boys dancing together in my life. And had I seen them dancing together, I said, hmm, what in the world? Hmm. Yeah, what, what's this? What, 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 what's going on here? Anyhow, you know. You see, homosexuality wasn't respectable then, and biblically speaking, it's not respectable now. I grew up in a beach culture. A what? Beach culture. You from Florida? No. California? No. From Arkansas. Beach culture in Arkansas? Yeah, about 30 miles north. I was reared within 100 yards of White River. We didn't call them beaches. We called them sandbars. Well, I hadn't been a Christian very long till I decided I probably ought to quit mixed swimming. Well, why in the world would you take a position like that? Because there was a lot of female flesh exposed when I went to the sandbars. And I thought, well, if I want to keep a pure mind, I'd probably be better off just not to be in a place like this. And you need to remember that the swimsuits worn by the ladies in those days looked like fur coats in comparison to what they wear now. <laughs> so I thought the Lord... Wanted me to quit that, and so I decided to quit. When I was baptized, I did not lay down the cigarettes. Kept right on smoking. There were many preachers and many elders and deacons in the church who smoked in those days. It was not frowned upon like it is now. I hadn't been a child of God very long till I decided I ought to quit smoking. Well, why? For health's sake? No. That wasn't the reason. Now, in high school during the athletic season, I always put tobacco aside for two reasons. I really did not want to give my opponent an edge. So I was willing to give up tobacco in order to have a better opportunity to whip him. That was one. And the second reason was we had some narrow-minded coaches. Although they themselves might smoke, they wouldn't let their athletes smoke. So I'd always lay aside tobacco for the athletic season. Then after it was over, I'd pick it up again. Of course, in the military, I smoked all the time. I hadn't been a Christian very long. I said, well, I probably ought to quit smoking. Why? Because of health reasons? No. Because I can have a better influence for Jesus Christ as a non-smoker than I can as a smoker. And folks, if you're inclined to doubt that, I'll tell you what you try to do. Next few days, see if you can get into a hole in this home to study the Bible with those people, and you've got a cigarette dangling between your lips. They're going to doubt the reality of your religion. And I gave up smoking because Jesus is Lord, and I thought that's what the Lord wanted me to do. Now, there were a lot of things that I didn't understand when I became a Christian. What about this church attendance bit? Well, Sunday night was still a part of Sunday, so I thought I ought to go not only Sunday morning, but also on Sunday night. So I attended church Sunday morning and Sunday evening. What about midweek service? I didn't go to that. There are some of the older folks here in the audience who remember Charles Coyle Sr. He's one of the best men God ever made. I had a part in burying him two years ago, last December. But Charlie and I were roommates, both youngsters, both recently converted, both wanted to preach the gospel, but we had a lot of things to learn. And we did not attend church service on Wednesday night. He and I were both on the same flag football team. He played in the line and I played halfback. And we had a football game one afternoon, one Wednesday afternoon. After the game was over, we went back to our room and we were sitting sitting there cooling down. And Lester Balcom walked down the hall. It's obvious that Lester had had a bath and he had on clean clothes and he was going to church. And so he stuck his head into our room and he said, Hey, boys, aren't you going to church? I said, Les, we don't have time. Well, he asked, Do you have time for athletics? 
Well, it's pretty obvious. We smell like a couple of camels. And then uh, he said, well, do you have time for the girls? Well, Charlie and I were both single. And we were both looking for a wife, and we were looking hard. I mean, we were looking hard. Well, of course, I just wanted to twist his head off. We well, say, why? Because he was right. And I have missed very few midweek services since that happened in 1949. That's what I thought the Lord would want me to do. And the elders had arranged a meeting for us on Wednesday evening, so I thought that I ought to go and be there. Well, what about the contribution? When I went to church on Sunday morning, I would reach into my pocket, and whatever I happen to have in loose change is what went into the collection. Now, let's see. This evening, I have 67 cents in loose change, so that would be the contribution. If it's 35 cents next Sunday, that's what goes into the collection. Whatever it is in loose change, that's what I gave. And I was looking to see if Billy Maddox is here. Brother Maddox, are you here anywhere? Yeah, that's where you're supposed to be. All right. I don't need these glasses except to see. But uh, anyhow, here's Billy over here. And Brother Maddox stood one Sunday morning. He doesn't even remember it. And he preached a sermon on giving. And he took these two ears of mine and he pinned them to the sides of my head. Brother Maddox, the first time in my life I ever reached to my help. But when they got that collection plate to me that day, I got out my wallet and, as the country boys say, I got hold of some of that silent money. Now, that's the kind that doesn't make any racket when it hits the tray. I put in a dollar. A dollar the first time I ever did it in my life. Now, kids... It was John York who stood right here at this platform a couple of years ago, and he said he did not learn to give when he was a college student, and he said it was 20 years later before he learned to give. Now, I want to say a few things about giving. My GI Bill of Rights played out before I finished school, which means that I had to go on my own. I worked 21 hours a week for the school at 50 cents an hour. I think that figure is $10.50. And I was being paid $20 a week to preach for a church about 50 or 60 miles north of here. And so I could take that $30.50 a week, live on it, take care of tuition and fees, and give $5 a week back to the Lord's cause. You need to learn to give while you're young. When our son Michael graduated from high school... He didn't get very many gifts except in the form of money. That kid got between $400 and $500 at his graduation. He made such a killing, he wanted to re-graduate. I mean, he's ready to do it over again. So I kind of slipped up next to him and I said, Mike, don't you think the Lord ought to get his cut? He said, now, Daddy, they didn't give this to the Lord. They gave it to me. <laughs> I said, well, don't you think he ought to get his cut? Now, he'd been around us long enough, he knew what the Lord's cut was. It was at least 10%. I never gave my kids a nickel, a dime, or a quarter to put in the collection tray. Always gave them at least a dollar. The nickels, the dimes, and the quarters were spent over here at the ball games. But I wanted them to know that the big money went to advance the kingdom of God. Well, I didn't say anything more to him. A couple of weeks later, his mother called me aside and said he wrote a check for 40-some-odd dollars and dropped it in the collection. Well, I just shot up to about 10 feet tall. I could hardly get out of the house because he had made that decision. You see, he learned to give when he was young. You need to learn to give when you're young. We have 31 elders at College Church. I know and love every one of them. Pray for them with some degree of regularity. And I would be willing for these 31 men to look at our financial records for 1997, 1996, 1995. As a matter of fact, they can see our records for any year they want. And if they can see every nickel we've made and every nickel we've given away, and if our giving has not been in harmony with our prosperity, if these good men will simply tell us what we ought to give, we'll do it. Someone said, you don't mean that. I do mean it. You want to talk about hard times? You want to talk about the Depression? You want to talk about someone's people looking for work at 50 cents a day and couldn't find it? You want to talk about chopping cotton for a dollar a day and I'm talking about pulling that, that gooseneck hole for 10 hours out of that hot blazing sun? I tell you what, folks, I've chopped it, I've picked it, I've pulled bowls. As a matter of fact, every time I pass a cotton patch today, I get another call to preach. I mean, that, that's the way I feel about it. I mean, you want to talk about hard times? My grandmother and I paid $3 a month on our house. That was house rent, $3 a month. And then to be blessed financially the way I have been blessed, 
I may go to hell, but I'm not going to go to hell for being stingy and tight-fisted. I believe the Lord wants us to be generous. I know one thing the Scripture says. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and I know Melchizedek got a tent. And frankly, I have never had a close Christian friend in my life who gave less than a tent for the ongoing of the kingdom of God. Now, I have an opinion that that does not necessarily all have to be done at the local church level, but I won't go into that. Well, why in the world do you give what you give? Because I think that's what the Lord would have me to do. I think He wants us to give. The day I was baptized, I knew that the Lord wanted me to share the good news with others. Now, I was pretty ignorant, but I knew that I had a responsibility to tell others about the love of God. It was simply too good for me to keep my mouth shut. I had to tell others. Let me talk to the kids for a minute. Kids, why is it that you don't cheat in a class? I know why. It's the Lordship of Jesus. Why is it that most of you, the majority of you here at Harding, don't get out here as boys and girls and roll around on the lawn with one another? It's the Lordship of Jesus. Tell me why it is that most of you do not stand out here on this campus with your arms around one another, embracing and kissing in broad open daylight before God and everybody else. I'll tell you why. It's the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Tell me why you're involved in athletics, that you play enthusiastically, you play with vigor, you play with abandon, but you always do your dead level best to pray, play fairly. I've put some hard licks on people in athletics. I've taken some hard licks. I've hurt others in athletics. I've been hurt in athletics. But I can tell you this, as a child of God, I never wanted to maim or cripple anyone. I never wanted to put anybody down so he couldn't get up again. Why is it that you want to play hard, enthusiastically and competitively, but at the same time you want to play fairly? Because of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Why is it when you're on a date, you treat that young lady the way you'd want someone to treat your sister under similar circumstances? It's the Lordship of Christ. Why would you not allow that young man to take liberties of your body that belong only to a husband? It's because of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I can cite you Harding rules. We've got a student handbook just filled with rules. But I'll tell you this. When the majority of the kids at this school decide that they're not going to follow the rules, we'll simply have to shut our doors. Because we're not running a police state. It's not the rules in the handbook. It's the Christ who's behind the rules in the handbook that will get submission and obedience to what's in that handbook. That's what will do it. The Lordship of Jesus. Why is it that you men strive to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it? And don't tell me it's always easy. Why do you try that? The Lordship of Jesus. Why do you ladies always strive to be in submission to your husbands as the church is in submission to Christ? And don't tell me that's always easy because of the Lordship of Christ. Why is it you strive to bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord because of the Lordship of Jesus? Why is it you as young people respect and honor and obey your parents because of the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Why is it that this church has elders and deacons? We're convinced that's what the Lord wants. Why is it we partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? We're convinced that's what the Lord wants. Why is it we practice believers' immersion? We're convinced that's what the Lord wants. Why is it we teach that immersion is essential to salvation? We think that's what the Lord wants. Why is it we simply and only and just sing without instrumental accompaniment? Because we are convinced that's what the Lord wants. And all of us in this audience who profess to be disciples of Christ and followers of Jesus... Know that He is our Lord at home, at school, in the business, in the community, whatever the circumstances, wherever we are, Jesus is Lord and we want to live in surrender and submission and obedience to Him. And I repeat, the key to Lordship is repentance. Some of our old-time preachers would speak on repentance and they would call it God's hardest command. And I am convinced that's right. Don't you feel the struggle in your life? Can't you feel this? I'm not the only one in this room who can feel this. Surely I'm not the only one. Don't you feel this in your life morally? Can't you feel it in your life on doctrinal issues? Can't you see these antagonistic forces pulling in opposite directions? 
Do you have in your life what I do in mine? I say, well, dear God, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you this 95%, but I'm going to take care of this 5% over here. It's too big for you to handle. I'll take care of that. He says, Jim, I want that 5% too. Well, Lord, Lord surely not. let me have this 5 No, I want that. All right, all right, I'll give you that 5 Oh, and here's another 5% jumps up. Well, now, I'm going to take care of this. You can't handle it. I'll handle this. Lord. Oh, I want that. And that's the way life is. Somebody said, well, I don't feel these antagonistic forces. I don't feel these opposite pulls. I'm not trying to be mean. If you don't feel them, I think you've already surrendered to the devil. You've already gone over. I'm 67 years old. I've been a child of God for 48 years. And I can feel these pulls. I mean, the strain, the stresses going on in life. Jesus is the Lord. And He intends to run the whole life. And it's so hard for a half-hearted individual to walk with a whole-hearted Christ. He intends to be the master, the boss, the ruler. And we have to think in these terms, regardless of what we're doing, regardless of the circumstances, he must be the master. Now, I've got one more point to make. Please don't grab the songbook yet, but I've got one more point to make. If you have little children, what I have discussed tonight is going to be very, very important in their lives. Because if you study the Bible with your children and you pray with them at home as you ought to, and if you carry them to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and incidentally, those of you who aren't married, most of you are going to be. When your kids get up about eight, nine, ten years of age, they're going to be talking to you about being baptized. And when they begin to talk to you about being baptized, what are you going to say? Well, I know what you're going to say. The first thing you're going to do is ask them a question. Well, honey, why do you want to be baptized? Those of you who were over at College Church this morning at first service know that Sandra Ross, an 11-year-old young lady, was baptized into Christ. And when I talked to her last week about being baptized, of course, her mother and daddy's already talked with her a lot. But when I talked to her about being baptized, she gave me the answer I was looking for. When you talk to your children, they may say, I want my sins forgiven. Well, that's a reason for being baptized. I repeat Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or Acts 22.16, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But let me tell you something, folks. It's pretty easy sometimes for a child to parrot for the forgiveness of sins. Now, Marilyn and I have three children. I baptized all three of them. But I wasn't looking for them to be able to say simply for the forgiveness of sins. What I was looking for in the lives of those three children was their ability to say, I know that from now on I'm responsible not only to you and mother, but also to the Lord Jesus Christ. I was looking for them to be able to talk to me sensibly about lordship. Now, some of you don't know exactly what takes place here at Harding University, but there's a lot of rebaptizing that goes on here. I baptized one boy at Harding the third time. And he had been immersed twice before I immersed him by fellow gospel preachers. But I had to put him into the water the third time in order to make him happy. Now, I think sometimes young people feel like, well, I need to go to the water again. And they sort of have the view that going to the water again is magic. It's, it's an amulet. It, it, it'll take care of my problem. And so they're immersed a second or maybe even a third time. And God continues to recede in the background. And maybe instead of rebaptism, what is needed is just a simple act of rededication. But if you can get over the concept of lordship to a child, when that child is baptized, my opinion is later on in life, you're not going to have to be talking about reimmersion or rebaptism. I baptized our Cindy, who happens to be here tonight, when she was 10. I baptized our Mike when he was 10. I baptized our Jimmy when he was almost 12. And I explained to all three of those children that you need never to be immersed again. There is only one baptism. Ephesians 4, verse 5. And what I said to those three children worked very well, except in the case of Cindy. Now, I don't want to embarrass her, because she's in the audience. But Cindy Allen Payne is one of the best women God ever made. And I say that, of course, without any prejudice or bias at all. She just happens to be one of the best. But she's got a little streak of stubbornness in her. 
and I'm not sure where in the world she got that. I said, you ought, since you're an M.D., you ought to be able to explain it. But anyhow, she got that little streak. I guess that was from her mother. Anyhow, anyhow, she got that streak. So when she's about 17 years old, she came in from school one day and said to her mother, Daddy's going to have to rebaptize me. Well, I came in an hour and a half later, and she said, Daddy, I need to be rebaptized. Well, I said, let's eat. And then after we ate, we went to the den, and we talked for probably three hours, up one side and down the other. I said, honey, let's go to bed, and in the morning, if you still feel the same way, we'll go to the church building, and I'll rebaptize you. Got up the next morning, what do you think? Oh, she said, Daddy, I just had a bad day yesterday. And someone said, my, you mean you all wasted all of that time? Wasted it? I loved every minute of it. Boy, it was precious time to me to be able to talk to my own daughter about theology and about the implications of water baptism to have a serious discussion. You know, I just hate it that she's gone now and we can't have similar discussions. But the next morning she said, I just had a bad day yesterday. If I had to choose tonight between salvation baptism and lordship baptism, I would take lordship baptism hands down over salvation baptism. If an individual is immersed simply because of the goodies he can get, I'll guarantee you one thing, when the, when the subject of church attendance comes up, you're going to have a fight. If he's immersed just because he wants to get forgiveness of sins and he's not thinking in terms of surrendering his life to the Lord, when you start talking about contribution, it's going to be another fight. And when you begin to talk about soul winning, it's going to be another fight. But if an individual comes into the kingdom of God, perhaps understanding about the salvation bit, but knowing that he's doing it to satisfy his Lord... To please Him. And from now on, I'm going to be obedient to Him. When that individual is taught more, he will do more. Because he starts with that pliable, supple attitude. And he can be molded and shaped. I read this in some religious paper a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember which one. But a man had a sign in his office. Thy will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And every day he goes to the office, that's what he sees. Thy will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And that's what the Lord wants you and me to be. If you come here tonight in an unsaved condition, you have never yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Everything is in readiness. The important thing is that you yield your will to His will, and that takes place in repentance. And if you've not yet been baptized in the name of Christ, then you ought to be immersed and be raised to walk in newness of life. And that is the time when God in His grace and His mercy extends the benefits of Christ's shed blood to your soul and takes away all of your sins. And that's the time when He will fill you with the Holy Spirit. So you need to come tonight and do that. If you're one who used to serve the Lord faithfully, but you've grown cold and careless and negligent, you need to come back home. As I said in one of the services this morning, the Lord doesn't love you any less. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should be brought to repentance. So you could come back home tonight, and we'll pray with you and pray for you. And you can leave here in a right relationship with the Savior. You've been very kind. You've listened well. And I hope you'll make the right decision. Nate's going to lead us while we stand and sing. If you need to come, won't you do it? God bless you.